Mr. Quick Spot. Oh, yeah. All right. I tell you what, the er a person who believes that this wasn't set up by our own government is an idiot. We are part of the lost generations. Those generations who uh, functionally would be considered illiterate. Because we know neither how to read nor write. Especially when compared to the generations of the past. And of course, I'm talking about the generations of people who existed during the times of our author, Henry David Thoreau. During his time, entertainment was extremely limited to very few activities, traveling, caravans, and other uh, show persons. But I think one of the most entertaining entertainments that you could indulge in during that time was the word and hearing it spoken. Much like musicians today make songs that they can travel from city to city performing, authors during the time of Henry David Thoreau would write books and they would go from city to city reading what they wrote, especially if it was something popular that everyone was reading. And they would make a lot of money doing that because people would pay a lot of money to come out and hear what was written read by the person who wrote it, which was like really exciting. That entertainment has been lost. It has been taking over, taken over by movies, Nobody wants to hear the author of the Hunger Games series read her book. But they would much rather watch a depiction of the book on the silver screen, and they would pay money for that. Well, during the time of Henry David Thoreau, people didn't want to see a depiction. They wanted to actually hear the author read. So, so that they can compare with how they read, with how the author reads, because the author is probably going to be the final say in how that line or that paragraph or that word should have been said. You know, we, we do this in our minds. Well, no one listens to people read anymore. You used to love it when you were little babies how you would pester your parents to read to you your favorite little book, especially the father begged him to read, which was not something that was done often. But it was a treat, and it was your first introduction to literature and the book, and it actually made you like reading, or want to read, because it's something that your parents were doing. And of course, of course, most parents try to put a little drama in it to make it, you know, seem interesting. And uh, you would try to do the same when you read a book later to yourself. Well, I intended to go back to a more basic time by reading some of the chapters. To give you an idea of how it, I wouldn't say how it should sound, but how it sounds when someone reads it. You yourself, because this is not a book that you can read silently. I don't know if you figured that out. You actually need to read this to yourself. Not all of it, of course. You're not going to always be in situations where you can, but you need to, to do that. It improves everything. It improves your ability to speak, which many of you need to improve. It improves your ability to remember what you read, which everyone in here needs to do. It also helps you to have a better appreciation of the words and how they are put together. More specifically, the sentence, which here in a few weeks we will be talking about. The sentence being the most 
the, the basis of what you need to know in 10th grade and the foundation of all of the writing that you also need to know, paragraph, essay, including. If you're not reading to yourself, then you will never hear the sentence in your head when you're looking at it on the SAT, which creates a tremendous problem for the non-native speaker. Because the native speaker doesn't necessarily need to know each and every grammatical rule. We can read it and hear it and detect something wrong. The non-native speaker, that is an impossibility. This is something you cannot do unless you do a lot of training of yourself by reading to yourself. But as we know, this generation <laughs> does not read anything. So that training is not going to come about. But I'm hoping that you will at least attempt to do that. You will save yourself a lot of headaches with dealing with the SAT if you begin to read to yourself so that when you read, I mean read a lot, so that when you read to yourself, you'll still be able to hear the words. And hearing a problem in a sentence uh, is uh, extremely important when you're dealing with that kind of test. And uh, for you, above and beyond the current test takers, for you this is going to be extremely crucial because the grammar still will be tested on the SAT when you take it, but it will be in paragraphs and not sentences. And you will, be, you will have to be able to detect errors in sentences within paragraphs, which is even more difficult. So uh, I invite you to do that. Chapter 1, day 6, if you want to follow along. If you're not going to follow along, please respect the reader. Because I will not be the only one reading in front of the class in the future, coming weeks. <clears throat> this is the end of his discussion on philanthropy. And everybody in here should know what that word means because it was written so many times, especially in the last two parts, that it's impossible for you to know what was going on if you didn't. If you don't know what philanthropy is, and I can't imagine that you don't, it basically means giving charity or charitable giving. Now, this can be in an organization or it can be a person or a small group. Famous philanthropists, because you have to say the word in that way when you're talking about a specific person, would be Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Oprah Winfrey. These are the most famous of our time because of the amount they give. And they give a lot, billions. Then, of course, there are lesser knowns that you probably know, and you might even be one of them. <clears throat> you know, whenever you drop some money in a bucket, box, can, somewhere, you enter into the realm of philanthropy. Our author has a problem with this, organized philanthropy. Now let's just get this clear. He doesn't have a problem with giving charity. He has a problem with people saying, come a part of our organization, part of our group. You got to do this because you know you're this. You got to give that because you're that. You know, and he has a problem with, with it being forced, with it being forced. He doesn't like that idea of the name being written in the side the name, how much the person has given, or the group and the members of the group gave this. He has a problem with that idea of philanthropy, and uh, he, <clears throat> he feels that um, you would do much more by being more individualistic when it comes to uh, this kind of charitable giving. So these last, and I'm going to do the last five paragraphs before the complemental verses. That's the complemental verses is the part that kind of looks like poetry. I'm going to do the last five paragraphs. Philanthropy is almost the only virtue which is sufficiently appreciated by mankind. Nay, it is greatly overrated. 
And it is our selfishness which overrates it. A robust poor man one, one sunny day here in Concord praised the fellow townsmen to me because, as he said, he was kind to the poor. Meaning himself. The kind uncles and aunts of the race are more esteemed than its true spiritual fathers and mothers. I once heard a reverend lecture on England, a man of learning and intelligence, after enumerating her, meaning England, scientific, literary, and political worthies, Shakespeare, Bacon, Cornmill, well, Milton, Newton, and others, speak next of her Christian heroes, whom, as if his profession required it of him, he elevated to a place far above the rest as the greatest of the great. They were Penn, Howard, Mrs. Fry. Everyone must feel the falsehood and can't of this. <coughs> the least were not England's best men and women, only perhaps her best philanthropists. <coughs> I would not subtract anything from the praise that is due to philanthropy. But merely the name justice for all who by their lives and works are a blessing to man. I do not value chiefly a man's uprightness and benevolence, which are, as it were, his stem and leaves. Those plants whose greenness withered, we make herb tea for the sick, serve but a humble use, and are most employed by quacks. I want the flower and fruit of a man. That some fragrance be whipped over from him to me, and some brightness flavor our intercourse. His goodness must not be impartial and transitory act, but a constant superfluity, which costs him nothing and of which he is unconscious. This is a charity that hides the multitude of sins. The philanthropist too often surrounds mankind with the remembrance of his own cast off grief. And I do want to stop there. I wish I was as good as Obama when it comes to reading stuff. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I want to stop there because he's making his point very clear here. And this is going to be very important for you to understand when we get to the complemental verses. He is implying here, and it would be really, really beneficial if you were looking at the words right now. He is implying here that the one giving is also the one in need. The one giving, the philanthropist, is also the one who is in need, who is also poor. In Islamic school. I'm talking about tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's rolling the hard way. We don't want to roll quite that hard. We want to get one of them little minibuses. who believes that this wasn't set up by our own government is an idiot. Everybody's gone out of their mind.
quick spot. Oh, yeah.